Well, good morning. I want to welcome you to Peachtree Church, where we are joining Christ daily in the restoration of all things. Whether you're at home in your PJs, drinking a cup of coffee or hot chocolate with the kids running around, uh, we are just so glad that you're tuning in with us here this morning. It's been a great week. The Dodgers have won the World Series. I'm so sorry to all the Braves fans, but I will tell you this. If they beat the Dodgers, I would 100 percent be rooting for the Braves. After all, I grew up on Greg Maddox, John Smoltz, Chipper Jones, and a few others. So there's always next, next season. Well, we've been in a, an amazing series called One, Restoring Harmony in a Hostile World. And Rich spoke last week in Ephesians chapter three about how wide and deep and long the love of Christ is. And that for those who put their faith in Jesus, that they enter into a new family. And not only is this family here on earth present, but it's one that carries on into eternity. And so today, Rich continues in this series into Ephesians chapter 4, another powerful, powerful series, uh, chapter rather. Today, later on in the service as well, Vicki will be talking about All Saints Day. It's a day in which we celebrate brothers and sisters who have been promoted to the church triumphant. So stay tuned for that later on in the service. And I want to end by sharing this with you. It's, it's a busy week. It's a hectic week. As we know, the elections are closing down. They're coming to a halt. And I want to remind you that we don't put our hope in politicians, that we put our hope in Jesus. And I also want to remind you that Jesus holds all things together. So whatever happens, whatever results come out, know that Jesus is still on the throne, that he rules over all. And I want to remind you of a verse in James, James chapter 1, verse 19, that everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Would you join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, you are such a gracious God. You are a God who is patient. You are a God who is creative. You are a God who deeply loves us and knows when we lie down and when we get up. You know when we're going through difficult moments. And God, you most certainly knew us in our mother's wombs. You have beautifully made us, fearfully and wonderfully made us, Father. And we are so grateful that you have given us life and the life abundant. Father, we pray that you are glorified, that you are praised this morning. Amen and amen. Would you join me as we continue to worship this morning, singing to what a mighty fortress is our God.
mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. And yet that God invites us into intimate relationship with himself. And one of the best ways that we can express that is when we pray, when we talk to God and hear from God. So I invite you now to pray with me. Let's pray. God, you are indeed great and loving and wise and kind and holy and pure and compassionate. You're slow to anger and abounding in love. And you, God, deserve all praise and glory. And you deserve every part of my heart, but God, I live with a divided heart. I love you and I praise you, but I also love me and want my good and want my way to advance. And I've ignored your commands, God. You say to love your neighbor as yourself, but I don't even know their names. I seek myself, my ways. I'll help them if I can, God, but, but my divided heart makes me pursue my own good. I haven't loved my hungry neighbor well. I haven't loved my neighbor of a different race or different religion with the love with which you would love them. I've even made judgments about them without knowing them. I haven't loved my gay or transgender neighbor. To be honest, I've tried to avoid them. I haven't loved my sick neighbor. Instead, I just act happy and pretend that everything's going to be okay. God, you say to seek first your kingdom. I, I try. I, I really want to seek it. It's my desire, but I also seek my own kingdom where I can have the say in everything, where all will bend their will to me instead. And you say, come to me all who are weary and heavy burdened and I'll give you rest. I'm really weary. I'm really tired and heavy burdened. So I do come to you and I lay that burden down, God. But then I pick it right back up choosing to continue to worry, choosing to fuss, choosing to try to figure it out on my own. God, I pray that you would forgive me. But I also ask you to change me. I pray this as a confession for my sin. But I also pray and ask you for a changed heart, a heart that is not divided, a heart that loves my neighbor as myself, Give me a heart that seeks first the kingdom of God. I ask for a heart that comes to you weary and burdened and lays it all down to you to find hope and healing and rest. And I pray, God, that you would make us a church that lives with undivided hearts, individually but also collectively together. Make us people who are passionate for your word. Make us people who lavishly share the love of Jesus with all around us. Make us people who seek justice and equality and goodness. And God, this week, we pray for the election on Tuesday. And we pray for the responses to the results of that election. We pray for hearts and minds that are yielded to you and to your kingdom. And that's what we pray for. We pray that you will help us to join you daily in the restoration of all things. God, help us to pursue your kingdom. We make our prayer in the name of Jesus. As we all pray together now the prayer that Jesus taught to his disciples, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, here at Peachtree, we are in a season of generosity. There are opportunities to continue to show our love for God and show our love for God's people here in Atlanta and all over the world. And you can sh- join in sharing that love by supporting the church. So we ask those of you who've not yet returned your pledge card, you can mail that in, you can go online and you can do that. But join with us as a church as we seek to join Christ daily in the restoration of all things. Giving is an act of worship. So with our hearts turned to God, let's continue to worship.
Well, good morning, Peachtree, and I hope that each and every one of you is doing okay. The Conwisher family celebrated last night at about 11 o'clock at night when our power kicked on. The good news was that we got power. The bad news is, is that we had just crawled into bed, and that means that we got out of bed, danced, and celebrated that we finally had power and then had trouble going back to sleep. So I hope that you're doing well. Obviously, if you're watching this, you have power and hope that all of you are surviving that wallop of a tropical storm that got us here in the Atlanta area and in the southeast. Well, hey, Tuesday's coming up, and Tuesday, in case you haven't noticed, is Election Day. And I just am so glad that it's finally coming. I remember one time when Kelly and I were actually in the United Kingdom and we were getting a tour of the House of Parliament and they told us that the election cycle in the UK is a little less than two months. I coveted the fact of that their election cycle takes place in such a condensed period of time because it feels like this thing has been going on for forever. I encourage you to vote. Uh, remember that you are not only a citizen of heaven, you are also a citizen of the United States, as you're probably listening to this message, and it's really important for you to exercise your civic responsibility and duty to be able to make sure that we participate in this election. But I also want to remind you to not lose your sense of behavior, your sense of sanity, your sense of perspective, your sense of humor as we go through this period of time. In fact, I want to share with you some of my favorite yard signs of this election. The first one, any functioning adult 2020, like anybody, come on, let's just get this going. My second favorite, giant meteor 2020. It does feel like this year has been a big collision. Just end it already. And then my favorite one, this is a picture I actually took when I was in Alabama driving through within the last couple of months. Jesus 2020, we need to be reminded of where our true obligation and our true loyalties lie. In fact, one of the things that I wanna just kind of say here at the outset with regards to this election is that we need to be reminded when we look back over history, we've had good presidents, we've had bad presidents. When you look back over Israel's history, there were good kings and there were bad kings and God was sovereign through it all. God is still in charge. God is still with us. He is still for us as a people. And I don't want you to lose that, either that sense of humor or that sense of perspective as you walk into this election. Because today, a lot of us, and scholars refer to this, social scientists call it identity politics. Our, our identities are so wrapped up into our political allegiances and the people that we look toward. And I would say that it's actually not so much identity politics as it is idolatry politics. That as a follower of Jesus Christ, that if we put our hope and our confidence and our trust really any, in anything other than God, then we will find ourselves to be disappointed. So whether you find yourselves on the winning side of this election or on the losing side of this election, remember Jesus in 2020 and that we all need to hold together. My purpose in today's message is not so much who should we vote for and what parties should we really adhere to. My message this morning is what happens on the other side of this election? What happens when we wake up on Wednesday still as a divided country, even though we may have elected a new president in that period of time? What can we do in the midst of a divided country to pull back together? That's what I want to talk about what can we do. And I wanna remind you that we're in the midst of a series on the book of Ephesians. And it's about how we might be one. Jesus' prayer was that we might be one. And we're gonna discover in particular in today's passage that God wants us to be united in him. And that the book of Ephesians is divided in half. The first three chapters are all about finding peace. And the second half is all about in keeping the peace. And we're actually kind of on the, just at the beginning of chapter four with today's passage, Ephesians chapter four, starting in the first verse. As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Be completely humble. Be gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. 
There is one body and one spirit, just as there was one hope to which you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. And this is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. Now, what does he ascended mean, but he also descended to the lower earthly regions, and that he who descended is the very one who ascended higher than the heavens to fill the whole universe. And so Christ himself gave the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the pastors and the teachers to equip his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Therefore, we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here or there by every wind of teaching and the doctrine and the cunning and the craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its own work. I absolutely love that passage. To me, it's one of the great crown jewels of the New Testament. Well, today I want to begin with a story, a story of something that took place on September 16th of 2017. This was not too long after the tragedy that took place from the rallies and the collision that happened in Charlottesville, Virginia. And in the midst of this, on the National Mall, there was a guy by the name of Tommy Hodges who pulled together what was being called the mother of all Trump rallies in Washington, D.C. And at the same time, Black Lives Matter was also planning a, another rally, a counter rally, if you will, and they were going to be colliding on the mall together. And they, as both leaders said, and what you could see on social media, they were gearing up for a fight. Well, the day arrived and Tommy Hodges, who was the head of this Trump rally, decided to do something that nobody expected. He went up to a guy by the name of Hawk Newsom, who was the head of Black Lives Matter in New York and who was in charge of this particular rally. And he invited Hawk to come to the stage. I want to show you a picture of that here. He invited Hawk to come to the stage and gave him two minutes to address the Trump rally. And so you can see Hawk there with his Black Lives Matter t-shirt. And his two minutes, you can check it out on YouTube, went viral. Over 50 million people have seen it. And by the time he got to the end of it, there was a standing ovation. Hawk is a devout Christian, and he prayed before he got up, and he addressed that crowd. And his last words in the rally, of, rally cry of what he said was this. He said, listen, I want to leave you with this, and I'm gone. If we really want to make America great, we do it together. After people cheered and Hawk Newsom got off of the platform, there was a guy who was the head of the Bikers for Trump U group in the United States. And he said, man, I loved what you said. I agreed with 90% of what you said, and I'd be honored if you would come and meet my son. And so as soon as Hawk Newsom got off the stage, he met this guy and he picked up his son and they grabbed a couple of photos together. And it was a remarkable moment of unity in the midst of incredible heated conflict. How did it happen? How did the bomb get diffused and they come together? Well, the way that I think that we discover it is that we discover that unity comes through maturity. It was the maturity of a Tommy Hodges who invited to share the stage and the platform and to listen, not just to speak and to animate their base. 
It was the maturity of Ahak Newsom who addressed the crowd and appealed to our common identity as Americans and tapped into his conviction as a Christian, as a follower of Christ. These two mature leaders were able to bring people together in a way where you thought that they were going to tear each other apart. You know, over and over again in the passage that we read just a few moments ago, it keeps talking about unity and maturity, unity and maturity, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. Paul wants us to understand this pairing, that there is no unity without maturity, and there is no maturity without unity. And I think that the way that we can kind of seal this and understand this mostly together is by looking at one verse, Ephesians 4.2. This is something that I would ask you to commit to memory, to take it internally to it. And it's this verse, I wanna put up this screen right here. Be humble, be gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Ephesians 4.2 says, be humble, be gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. That is the type of maturity that will bring unity. And so first let's talk about being humble and it's with this verse. But to each one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. And this is why it says when he ascended on high he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean but that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? And he who descended is the very one who ascended higher than the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and the teachers to equip his people for the works of service. This is the most confusing part of today's passage, so I wanted to explain to you at the outset. Paul is talking about how Jesus, and in the first three chapters we've seen this, has ascended higher to the heavens, that Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, and yet in the midst of that, he descends, he condescends to be with us. And in dwelling with us, the one who is the one who ascended, descended, and then ascended in order to put himself and us at his rightful place. In other words, there's this journey from being on high to humility of Christ. And so that Christ would give us his gifts and that he shared that, that each and every one of us has a gift and that we recognize that reality of all of our giftedness, that all of us have been blessed, and that all of those gifts are for the work of service, that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to offer his life as a ransom for others. So humility is the first mark of Jesus Christ, and it's the first attribute of maturity of the followers of Christ. And when we exhibit humility, it's amazing the unity that can follow. I want to show you a picture of the celebration of a highly unusual NBA season. These are the NBA champion Los Angeles Lakers. And I was rooting for this team wholeheartedly because a dear friend of mine works for the Laker organization as an executive and was instrumental in helping to pull together this team. And the two stars of this team that were pulled together recently are these two guys. On the left there, LeBron James and Anthony Davis. And the question is, as they pulled together these two megastars, how do you get two people with all of that talent, all of that ability to come together and to be able to work together in an organization? And the reason that my friend Rob said that they were able to do this is because of their commitment as an organization, and particularly these two stars, a commitment to what he calls humble confidence. From day one, when Anthony Davis showed up on the team and in the locker room for the Los Angeles Lakers. It was, do you want number 23 or should I wear number 23? It was always deferring to the other. In fact, one of the mantras is that you can accomplish almost anything as long as you don't care who gets the credit. Both on the court and on the court, what made this organization really special in this last year was that they didn't care who got the credit and that each one of them played in such a way that they made the other people better. There might have been other teams in the NBA that had more talent all over on the squad, but they were the best team 
because of the way that they treated one another and had their commitment to sharing and to humility in the organization. Teamwork is so underrated in our world today. And a guy by the name of Patrick Lencioni out of California, a great business writer, has written a book called The Ideal Team Player. And with humility, he describes this. He puts it like this. He says, great team players lack excessive ego or concerns about status. They are quick to point out the contributions of others and slow to seek attention for their own. They share credit, emphasize team over self, and define success collectively rather than individual. It is no great surprise then that humility is the single greatest and most indispensable attribute of being a team player. He then goes on to even quote, because Patrick Lencioni is a devout Christian, he goes even on to quote C.S. Lewis and talking about in humility, we don't think more of ourselves, we don't think less of ourselves. Instead, we just think of ourselves less. The first attribute to us being able to bring unity back to this country is going to be a commitment to unity where we don't care who gets the credit. What we do care about is being able to play together as a team, as a country. And so how does maturity come from, or unity come from maturity rather? It comes first from humility, and then secondly, it comes from gentleness. Think of this verse here. Instead, speaking the truth in what? In love. We will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. It is not just truthfulness, but it is love that enables us to be able to represent Christ. A lot of the times we feel incredibly self-righteous and justified that if we feel like we have the truth on our side, if we feel like that we're right, that we can treat anybody the way that we want to with our words because we feel justified in our convictions. Well, the Apostle Paul says it's not just about truth. It's not just about proclaiming truth. It's about proclaiming truth in a spirit of love and that that is a heart and a part of the gospel. The Barner Organization did a survey not that long ago in a study where they tested this assumption. Are Christians more like Jesus or are they more like Pharisees? If you don't recall Pharisees or the religious leaders in Jesus' day and age that he's often so hard on because of their hypocrisy. And so this is the data that they uncovered. They looked at both Christ-like attitudes and pharisaical attitudes, as well as Christ-like actions and pharisaical actions. And what they discovered is, is that in the public's perceptions was that 51% of the people who knew a Christian reported that Christians were more like the pharisaical attitudes and actions than they were like Christ-like. Only 14% fully seem to reflect both Christ-like attitudes and actions. And so I want to demonstrate this next with the next slide here. These were the pharisaical attitudes that they were talking about, that they were testing on, that Christians, 51% of us, were more like judgmental, argumentative, opinionated, obnoxious, rude, hypocritical, arrogant, narrow-minded, and harsh Friends, this is not just a PR problem. This is a real problem because we have forgotten the value of gentleness. We have forgotten what it means to be able to not just feel like you're right, but also to be able to live out that love in the gentleness of Christ. In fact, I loved this conviction from the study. It says this, that 84% of Americans personally know a Christian. Actually, this was 84% of non-Christians, I should say, know a Christian. And only 15% of those non-Christians say that those Christians that they know are different in a good way. To me, the primary struggle with this is that of gentleness. And the New Testament reminds us of this. In 1 Peter, it says this, even amongst great persecution in which this letter was written, your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. 
One of the most gentle people that I have ever known is a man by the name of Dallas Willard. He was one of my professors. He was the head of the philosophy department at the University of Southern California. Dallas Willard is also one of the smartest men that I ever knew, and one of my favorite stories about him is that he was in his classroom and somebody was berating him in terms of berating Dallas about the Christian faith and belittling him and was saying inaccuracies about the faith. And this was towards the end of the classroom and Dallas listened for a little while. And then he said, you know, I think that's a really good place for us to end today. And he ended the class. One of the Christians came up to Dallas afterwards and asked him, Dallas, why didn't you put him in his place? Dallas, why didn't you correct him? Why didn't you set the record straight? Why didn't you defend what you could have done so well? And Dallas said these words. He said, because I am practicing what it means to not have the last word. Dallas chose gentleness over that arrogant, argumentative, obnoxious, behavior that so many of us exhibit. We not only need to be humble in order to bring this country back together, we need to demonstrate the gentility of Christ. So first, be humble. Secondly, be gentle. And then thirdly, we need to be patient. This is not my favorite one. This one cuts against me pretty good. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. In other words, the patience that is called forth for us in order to create unity through maturity, it's not something that's automatic. It doesn't happen overnight. It's the kind of thing that takes time to develop. Well, when they opened several years ago, Disney Shanghai, I'll show you an image here of what the castle looks like in Disney Shanghai. Um, they didn't realize that as they opened it, that there was a particular challenge that many of the people that would be come and visiting Disney Shanghai were from the rural areas and they did not understand or know or have any practice with queuing or with waiting. So when they let people in the first time, people were pushing through all of the different waiting turnstiles and pushing people out of the way. So they actually had to start doing training before they let you into the park to make sure you understand what it's like to stand in a queue. They were learning how to be patient and how to be patient together. Patience truly is a learned behavior. The company Timex actually did some research on patience in the United States. We as a country will wait in any given year a collective amount of about 37 billion hours of waiting in the United States in one year. 37 billion hours of waiting. That's a lot of waiting. And as my family can tell you, I'm not very good at it. Timex has these stats here. We will wait 13 seconds before we honk at a car in front of us that has stopped at a green light. Actually, in Atlanta, that number is a little low. We will wait 26 seconds before we shush people who are talking in a movie theater. We will wait 26 seconds before we take the seat of someone who's walked away. We will wait 45 seconds before we ask someone who's talking too loud on a cell phone to keep it down. We will wait 13 minutes for a table at a restaurant. We will only wait 20 minutes for a blind date to show up before we leave. And we will only wait 20 minutes for the last person to show up for Thanksgiving before we are willing to dig in. We are a people who do not like to wait, but there's something that can happen in our waiting, in our patience, that's really important for the character of our soul. New York Times did a great study and kind of article on the Houston Hobby Airport. And the Houston Hobby Airport was one that we used to, when we lived in Houston, fly in and out of all the time. It's a small, concise airport for the volume that the airport does. And it was incredibly efficient to walk from one place to the other. Um, It took about on average eight minutes for your bags once you got off the plane to be able to get them to the turnstile. And they had one of the highest complaining rates in the United States of people waiting for their bags. And they couldn't figure out because the eight minutes was not a long standard. In fact, it was less than what would be true at a lot of other airports. Well, what they discovered in the research is it wasn't that people were waiting longer in the sense of that it took longer for the bags to get there. It's that they were waiting longer and that it only took a person on average about one minute to be able to walk from their uh, arrival gate to the baggage turnstile. 
In other words, people were waiting there and they didn't have anything to do and that's why the complaints were up. So when they renovated the Houston Hobby Airport, they didn't make the baggage get there any faster. All they did was move the arrival gates further away so that it takes people longer to walk there. And the minute that they did that, my friends, all the complaints went away. Because a lot of the times on the whole, as soon as they got there, their bags were actually waiting for them. And so this article talks about the difference between occupied time and unoccupied time. And as Christians, this should be something that is so dear to our hearts. Is that as we wait, we wait on the Lord. We wait in the Lord. We wait for the Lord. That for us, there's no such thing as unoccupied time. Because in our waiting, we get to be in God's presence. I love how Rick Lawrence puts it. He puts it like this. Jesus shows up late to reorient the focus of our waiting. The one thing that will transform unoccupied time to occupied time is a kind of settling into his intimate presence. I don't like to wait, but God calls us to be patient. And so be humble, be gentle, be patient, and finally, bear with one another in love. Look at the scripture. One body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of some, who is over a few, through a handful? No. Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. God bears with all of us, no matter what. Well, Pete Davidson works for Saturday Night Live, and he decided to make fun of a variety of politicians uh, a handful of years ago. And one of the politicians they made fun of was this man by the name of Dan Crenshaw. Dan is a celebrated American war hero. He sacrificed himself and from a bomb in Afghanistan, lost his eye. And Pete Davidson decided to mock him openly on the air. As soon as he did this, people got really upset. There was a backlash. And in the midst of it, uh, Pete got depressed. In fact, he got so sad and depressed that he wondered what his purpose in living was anymore. Dan, instead of lashing out like many people did back at Pete, actually reached out to him in compassion and got close to him. And in doing so, what he did was he drew near to him and built a bridge instead of fighting back. And so a few weeks later on Saturday Night Live, they decided to bury the hatchet with this together. In that moment, they came together and they demonstrated forgiveness. Pete leaned over to Dan Crenshaw when the mics were off and as soon as that moment was over and shook his hand and said, you're a good man, thank you. Dan reminded us that we're in this together. It is that bearing with one another in love that is so important right now. Scott Sauls puts it like this. Those of us who identify as Christian have been given a resource that enables us to respond to outrage and wrath in a healing, productive, and life-giving way. Because Jesus Christ has loved us at our worst, worst, we can love others at their worst. Because Jesus Christ has forgiven us for all of our wrongs, we can forgive others who have wronged us. The way for us to get to a place of mature unity is to be able to experience unity of Jesus Christ and for us to be able to do that by being his representatives in the world. The only way forward for us as a country, regardless of the outcome of our vote, is for us to become a different kind of people. I would venture to say that no single politician or even class of politicians is going to be able to rescue this country from the trajectory that we are on. It will take a movement of us demonstrating the maturity and the unity of Christ. 
And so here's what we need to be humble, to be gentle, to be patient, and to bear with one another in love. Let's pray together. Eternal God, we pray in the coming days for our country, for our local communities, all the variety of elections that are taking place. And Lord, I pray that you will give us uh, wisdom, courage, insight, and help us to know what to do as a country. And not so much in also, you know, not just so much in our voting, but even more so in our character and how we behave and how we'll respond to this vote. Lord, pull us together as a country. And we know that the only way that that can happen is through the way of Christ. Help us to make every effort to keep the peace today, to speak the truth in love, to demonstrate that we have one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. One God who is over all and in all and through all. You are the source of our unity. And we beg that you would give that to us now as a people. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to communion, I want to invite all of you to join me at the table. If you need to quickly pause and get your elements together at home, go ahead and do that. But we can still be one family, one community in Christ as we gather here at the table to remember. So you're invited to come. The Bible tells us that on the last night of his life on earth, Jesus shared a meal with his disciples. And during that meal, he took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to them and he said, take, eat. This is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. It would have been their custom to share together one common cup. And as they did that, Jesus said, this cup represents a new covenant, a new promise that's made sure and certain by the pouring out of my blood. But this is my blood, which is poured out for you. So take it and drink it, remembering me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. Will you pray with me? God, I thank you for the spiritual nourishment that you give us in this meal. Be present with us, strengthen us to serve you and to be part of your kingdom as it advances on the earth. We thank you for body and blood that remind us, that show us what Christ has done and given for us. We celebrate and we give you thanks and honor in Christ's name. Amen. Now that we have had the pleasure of celebrating the sacrament of communion with each other, now we come to the reading of the names. These are the names of our members who have died and been promoted to the church triumphant over the past year. Because of the pandemic, there were unusual circumstances this year. Many of their family and friends could not travel and could not gather for funeral services. They weren't remembered at the time of their death the way they normally would have been. So this year, as we hear their names and remember them with love, let us in our own way celebrate the fact that they are well, they are safe, and they're in the cloud of witnesses that watch over us to cheer us on. They belong to us and we are better for their lives among us. Now for the reading of the names. 
Jack Bossert, Steve Bomar, Rita Buckner-Smith, Caroline Tomey, Jerry Fryer, Lib Trulock, Ron Toland, Nancy Musara, George Lane, Harold Brooks, Joan Millsap, Todd Yates Sr., Nan Durrett, Margaret Schuerman, Bob Larkin, Ed Mall, Jane Bennett, Earl Pennington. Everett Jones, Frank Nix, Nancy Freeman, Lois Culberson, Chuck Schramm, Dorothy Boyce, David Carr, Carolyn Husk, Betty Payne, Catherine Loudermilk, Jane Marquis, Marion Sams, Phil Curtis, Dick McCamey, Betty Crimer, Lynn DeFour, Doug McKay, and Betty Jo Nemeth. Ed Jackson, Chuck Mann, Thomas Cheek, Bob Balfour, Ann Norvell, Robert Mathis, Martha Mobley, Scott Bowes, Hank Powell, Dan McCall, Bill Moorer, Nancy Jordan, Gary Snow, Catherine Gooding, and Alex Mullen. I love those words that we get from that amazing hymn. From earth's wide bounds, from ocean's farthest coast, through gates of pearl streams in the countless host, singing to Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, Alleluia, Alleluia. We're reminded of the faithfulness of God on this day where we celebrate all saints and we remember those who have gone before us in the great church triumphant. I also want to remind you that as we too at, here at Peachtree, that as we move forward in faith, as we move forward together as a community of faith, that we pull together ourselves, our resources, time, treasure, talent, all. If you have not had a chance to fill out your 2021 commitment card, whether you do it online or whether you do it in person, we want to make some exciting plans and want to be faithful in the resources that you entrust to us if you have any questions, you can contact us at the church office, but we would love to partner with you to mobilize kingdom resources to help maturity demonstrate the unity that is the body of Christ. This is what our world so desperately needs right now, is the gospel of the humility and the gentleness and the patience of what it means to bear with one another in love. These are the antidotes 
to the hostility that we need in order to be able to get to the harmony that is Jesus Christ. And so may the peace of Christ be with you, with all of us this week, and may it be so.